Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brain Map. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Mar Martino Center. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Yasmin Zakinios, completed her PhD in neuroscience at Yale University and her postdoc in radiology and biomedical imaging at Yale. She's now a junior faculty member in the psychiatry department at Yale University. Her work broadly focused on investigating the neural and molecular circuitry underlying several types of addictions and at risk populations such as tobacco smoking and alcohol use disorder using two neuroimaging techniques, PET and fMRI. Her, works, her work also emphasizes the importance of sex as biological variability variable in the study of addiction. I would like to remind the, the audience to please address any questions using the Q&A box or raise their hand at the end of the, the talk. Dr. Yasmin Zaginios, thank you very much for coming today. And the virtual stage is yours now. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to speak with you all today about some of the work that we've been doing at Yale. So as Chi Hyun mentioned, my name is Yasmin Zakinyas and I'm an associate research scientist at Yale. So the goal of my talk is to give you a better understanding of the dopamine system in folks that smoke cigarettes. Uh, I'll also highlight the critical role that sex plays in tobacco smoking behavior and the dopamine system. However, since uh, one of the major areas of focus of my talk is gonna be sex differences, I do wanna just make a really quick point before we begin, just to keep in mind. Um, so traditionally, when we think about sex, we define sex as male and female, and we define gender as man and women, and in this dichotomous way. However, uh, through scientific research, we've learned that gender may not always be binary, and also that one's gender might not align with uh, or be consistent with sex assigned at birth. Um, but most uh, biomedical research to this date has not yet adapted some of the current terminology. And so for my talk, I'm going to utilize the language in which studies have used to describe their participants. Um, so this language might seem outdated to some of you, but we hope that the field will move towards better and more sensitive distinctions with time. So tobacco smoking is uh, and remains the leading cause of preventable death worldwide and is responsible for 7 million deaths per year. Um, globally, more men than women smoke, but in the United States, prevalence rates are pretty comparable between men and women. And nicotine, which is the main additive chemical in cigarettes, is largely responsible for the positive and negative reinforcing effects of smoking. Um, we also know that quitting can be quite challenging. So around 80% of people who smoke cigarettes will relapse within a month. Um, and then only around 7% of smokers quit successfully each year. So generally for addictions, women who become addicted tend to progress from initial use of drugs uh, in addiction to, uh, to addiction at a much faster rate than men. And this is referred to as telescoping. And it's a phenomenon that was first reported in alcohol use disorder and has since been reported in several addictions, including behavioral addictions like gambling. And so it's important that we understand what biological and environmental factors contribute to this phenomenon. So starting with some preclinical work, um, several groups have observed that female rats compared to male rats exhibit greater locomotor response and behavioral sensitization to nicotine. Female rats also show higher rates of self-administration and they'll acquire self-administration at much lower doses of nicotine than males. Um, female rats also take in larger amounts of nicotine. And both preclinical and clinical studies have shown that stress plays a major role in the initiation of use in female but not male um, animals or people. And so studies have shown that during acute nicotine withdrawal, women report greater negative affect and greater cue-induced craving. And this is thought to be due to sex differences, more so in the ability to recover from or regulate negative affective responses rather than women experiencing more exacerbated negative responses to the stressor. And literature has also shown that um, cortisol is heightened in women and 
again, in women, heightened cortisol is predictive of relapse, whereas in men, lower cortisol predicts relapse. Um, so women who, um, women are also more likely to relapse to stress than men, and women have shorter periods of abstinence between relapse. Um, and so these studies suggest that maybe uh, it may be particularly important for women to be able to overcome deficits in emotion regulation that occur during um, moments of negative affect and stress. Um, literature has also shown that male and female smokers exhibit different smoking behaviors. So uh, men, on one hand, tend to smoke more for the drug or the rewarding effect. They're more reinforced by nicotine and cigarettes. Um, they engage in smoking to sort of be part of the group, and they're one and a half times more likely than men to stay abstinent on nicotine patch. Women, on the other hand, tend to smoke more for regulating stress, um, and they're not as sensitive to nicotine levels in cigarettes. They also tend to relapse in response to stress and negative mood, which might be related to poorer inhibition or emotion regulation. And this may also explain why women have a harder time quitting. So this is really important because nicotine replacement therapy, such as nicotine patches, are the first line of treatment, but women don't respond as well to it. Um, and unfortunately, the neurobiological bases for these sex differences are unknown, and so it's been quite difficult to design treatments that are sensitive to different genders. However, literature has shown that the neurotransmitter dopamine is important in all of these behaviors, such as reinforcement, stress regulation, cue salience, inhibitory control, et cetera. And so we thought that dopamine might be able to explain some of the sex differences in behavior that I'm showing you here. So when someone smokes a cigarette, inhaled nicotine enters the brain within seconds and it reaches maximal concentrations within about two minutes. And nicotine acts directly on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on dopamine cells, which are located in the ventral tegmental area and releases dopamine in the striatum as well as the prefrontal cortex. And dopamine is largely responsible for drug reinforcement that's been shown in preclinical and clinical literature. Um, and literature also shows that dopamine is blunted or hypofunctioning presynaptically after long-term nicotine use. And there is also evidence that dopamine alterations in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex might be affecting cognitive functioning. And so we can investigate the dopamine system using positron emission tomography or PET scanning. And I'll just give a quick overview of uh, PET scanning just for the folks that are not doing uh, PET imaging. And so during a PET scan, we inject a small dose of a radio tracer and it's injected into a participant and that's uh, radioactively decaying. And so we can use that decaying process um, to localize and quantify receptor availability. So as the radio tracer decays, it's gonna emit a positron, which is gonna come into contact with one of the many electrons in the brain and then emit a gamma ray in complete opposite directions. And so that's what's detected by the PET camera. Um, and identifies the location of that event. And so when we reconstruct the image, we can see a pattern similar to what we see here, which shows the amount of radio tracer that's specifically bound to the receptor of interest. In this case, we're interested in the dopamine D2, D3 receptor. And then we, in order to obtain sort of quantitative estimates of receptor availability, what we do is we extract the concentration of radioactivity in the tissue over time, and we feed this into a model, and that describes the behavior of the radio tracer. So with PET, we can examine um, neurotransmitters and receptor systems under various conditions with radio-labeled pharmaceuticals that are designed to selectively target specific sites. So for example, um, we can look at basal conditions, so without any intervention, just receptor availability. And this is really cool because uh, we can not only look at this at you know, the baseline level, but then we can also image neurotransmission by introducing a pharmacological agent. So we can have folks smoke a cigarette, we can give them nicotine, we can give them amphetamine, which is a really robust um, dopamine releaser, and we can get a measure as to whether neurotransmitter levels go up or down. Um, and then we can also use these techniques to better understand recept receptor functioning in addicted individuals relative to healthy controls, which can really provide clinical insight into the phenotype of addiction and identify potential targets of diagnosis and treatment for disease. So one of the ways in which we investigate basal levels of the neural chemical system is called dopamine receptor availability. Um, 
and what I'm showing you here is a presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. Um, and we can see dopamine is released and some of it's bound to the dopamine D2, D3 receptor. And literature has, has shown that decreased dopamine D2 receptor availability is a risk factor for addiction. So that's your baseline striatal dopamine tone. It's been recognized to be problematic if it's too low. And that's because we're looking at our core brain reward system. And so we need this system to process natural rewards like food. Um, and so it's important to have the system be healthy for quality of life. And so we can measure uh, dopamine receptor availability at baseline as well as um, after, uh, sorry, and then we introduce our uh, radio tracer here. And so that binds to those receptors. Um, and then we can also examine dopamine release, as I mentioned, by introducing some sort of challenge. So we can add in a drug and typically this is amphetamine just because it's very robust at producing a dopamine response, uh, but we can also use nicotine. Um, and so our drug here leads to more dopamine release. Some of that is bound to the receptor. And so there are less available receptors for the radio tracer to bind to. And then we can calculate things like binding potential um, as well as look at other sort of fancier modeling techniques um, to look at the difference between uh, these two conditions. And so I'll talk about some of the sort of fancier models that we used, uh, one of which is Evan Morris's LPNT PET technique. And then there's also Dr. Alpert's LSRM technique. Um, and those are really important for modeling sort of short-lived transient small dopamine responses that you get from a nicotine cigarette as opposed to amphetamine, which gives you more of a robust um, dopamine response. So as I mentioned previously, there are two main dopamine pathways in addiction, uh, both of which originate in the ventral tegmental area and then project either to the striatum in the mesolimbic pathway, which is known as our reward pathway, and that sort of drives the reinforcing effects of tobacco smoking. And then um, there are also dopamine projections via the mesocortical pathway to the prefrontal cortex. Um, that that's sort of known as the goal-directed pathway, and that drives um, inhibitory control, working memory function, et cetera, and it's compromised by stress. And so we thought that we might see differences in these pathways that could explain some of the behavioral sex differences that I just covered. Um, so first, we'll start with the reward or the mesolimbic pathway. So previous studies have begun to explore the dopamine system in tobacco smokers. And one study found that um, dopamine receptor availability is lower in smokers as compared to non-smokers. So again, this is consistent with addiction literature showing that drug addicted individuals just have lower receptor, dopamine receptor availability. Um, so this was a really interesting study. Um, however, it did not explore sex differences because this was an all male population. So another study that was conducted in male and female light smokers found that um, dopamine receptor availability is actually a lower dopamine receptor availability is specific to male smokers. So they did not observe the same findings in females. Um, so these studies were conducted under basal conditions. Um, so it sort of begged the question, well, what happens when you smoke a cigarette? Um, so some studies began measuring smoking-induced dopamine release using PET. Um, however, these studies had some you know, methodological flaws and, and none of them really examined sex differences. So one study found that there are no differences uh, between smoking and non-smoking scans um, in terms of dopamine release. However, this study had people smoke 15 minutes prior to getting into the scanner. And so it's possible that we might have um, missed that dopamine response. Uh, another study found that cigarette smoking slightly increased striatal dopamine release. Um, however, this study was conducted in mostly men. The subjects also left the scanner to smoke, um, and then it was a between subjects design. Uh, and then a third study um, showed that cigarette smoking following denicotinized cigarettes um, increased striatal dopamine release. And this study included a really small sample size. It was in all men and subjects smoked four cigarettes within 45 minutes, which can actually be quite aversive. Um, also, if you recall, men are better able to detect nicotine levels, and so you might not have observed the same thing um, had this been an all-female population. 
And then there were a number of other studies that are listed there that use sort of unnaturalistic stimuli such as nicotine nasal spray, nicotine gum, IV nicotine, et cetera. And so we wanted to examine dopamine changes in the brain in a more naturalistic setting by giving people a cigarette uh, to smoke during the scanner. So the uh, aim of our first study was to identify a biological substrate of sex differences using a cigarette smoking challenge. And so we had um, subjects be overnight abstinent so that the receptors are not occupied by the dopamine. And then we had male and female smokers smoke a cigarette while lying in the PET camera and simultaneously acquiring PET data. So after about 35 minutes of rest, um, subjects smoked a cigarette mid-session, and we had a vacuum filter placed above their head um, to collect secondhand smoke. And a researcher helped the subject ash the cigarette into the bin without moving their head. So our participants included eight males and eight females that were matched on smoking characteristics. The men, however, were slightly older, um, and its literature has shown that dopamine receptor density declines with age. And so we expected that the older males would potentially have less receptors and presumably a smaller dopamine response than females. But as you'll see, this actually did not confound the, confine the results because um, we're seeing sort of the opposite effect, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then just to orient you to brain slices that we'll be viewing, we're looking here at the ventral striatum as well as the dorsal striatum. And next, what I'll show you is a series of movies that we call dopamine movies to help sort of visualize a dopamine release after um, subjects or smoke a cigarette. So here's just an example of a dopamine movie from one representative subject. And so you can see the um, first set of brain scan, uh, the first slices of brain slices are showing um, subjects when after they've smoked a cigarette, and then the um, second row shows um, when they're at rest, so before they smoke a cigarette. And what you can see here is the release of dopamine in the striatum as compared to rest in the scanner. So subjects smoked around 35 minutes, so you can watch the clock at the top there and, and look for the dopamine response at the arrow that's there around 35 minutes. Um, and the color bar on the right just shows you the fractional increase of dopamine above baseline. So when voxels are orange, that's about a 100% increase in dopamine release relative to the rest condition that's shown there. And this movie was more of like a proof of concept just to show that, you know, lying in the pet camera does not actually release any dopamine. You know, we don't find pleasure in, in just lying in the pet camera. So next, I'm going to show you a representative subject at the top. So we have a female at the top and then a male at the bottom. Um, and we're just going to compare male and female smokers. Um, so you can see sort of when the dopamine comes on board and when you, you see that activation in females. Um, and what we found was that males had more significant voxels in the ventral striatum. And that's consistent with smoking for nicotine reinforcement, which is based in the ventral striatum whereas females had more significant um, dopamine voxels activated um, in the dorsal striatum. And that also fits with the literature showing that women tend to smoke more for cues and that this being this is more of a habit for them as a way to regulate stress. Um, so this figure is just a still shot of some of the movies that I showed you previously. And what we find is that in response to smoking a cigarette during a PET scan, there was a significant dopamine response in men in the ventral striatum, but this was absent in women. And the graph on the right just quantifies this and shows that men um, had a significantly greater number of striatal voxels that are activated by the cigarette as compared to women. And this finding is really important because traditionally when we think about drugs of abuse, we think, oh, they all you know, release dopamine in the ventral striatum, but this finding is telling us that this may not necessarily be the case in female tobacco smokers, um, because most of the drug reinforcement literature has been done in male rats. And so uh, we actually did not know this due to the male focused research. And so just to circle back to the point about um, the male group being older, we would expect that older age to dampen the dopamine response. But as you can see here, males show more dopamine release than females. And so in essence, the effect of age actually worked against our findings as opposed to accentuating our findings.
So what I've shown you so far is that the dopamine response to cigarette smoking is sexually dimorphic. And so the patterns we observed might explain some of the differences in behaviors that I discussed. We also show that the ventral striatum was identified as the primary biological substrate that might be underlying sex differences in the reinforcement of cigarette smoking. And then preclinical studies have previously shown that this ventral striatum activation is involved in the initial stages of addiction, but that with time, um, the dopamine activation moves more dorsally um, in, this, uh, in the dorsal striatum, which is more involved in habit formation. And so that sort of aligns with what we're seeing in terms of sex. So we can add that Cosgrove et al. study here that shows that female smokers have less dopamine release and mental striatum as compared to male smokers. Um, and so next we thought, well, what if we add a nicotine patch? So if we have nicotine patch on board, which we know works better for men than women, then how does the dopamine response to a cigarette differ when using this type of nicotine replacement therapy? So that's exactly what we did next. So for this next study, we're going to focus on um, smoking cessation treatments or nicotine replacement therapies, which is the first line of treatment. Um, so that includes things like nicotine patch, nicotine gum, nicotine nasal spray. Um, and nicotine replacement therapies have been shown to reduce cigarette use, but we don't actually know how this impacts the dopamine response. Um, in addition to sex, which I've you know, spent a good amount of time discussing, there are a, a number of other factors that predict um, treatment outcomes. And so these factors that have been purported to uh, predict treatment was something that we wanted to examine in this study as well. So one of those factors is nicotine consumption or nicotine dependence. Um, so higher consumption and dependence is associated with poorer treatment outcomes. And so for the study, we use pack years, which uh, accounts for cigarettes smoked per day, um, and the years smoked divided by the number of packs. Uh, the standard pack size is around 20 cigarettes, and so we use that as a measure of dependence. We also examined um, another factor, which is nicotine clearance rate, and that's measured using the nicotine metabolism ratio, or NMR which is the ratio of the two primary metabolites of nicotine, um, which are 3-hydroxycotinine to cotinine. Um, and this is a really cool um, uh, stable trait measure that's been shown to potentially be a biomarker of nicotine metabolism. Um, so there's this one study uh, by Lerman and colleagues that showed the treatment outcomes in subjects on nicotine patches um, relative to another uh, medication, which is an FDA-approved uh, medication for smoking cessation treatment called phrenoclin or Chantix, um, that you can, if you stratify by nicotine metabolism ratio, you can actually optimize quit rates. And so what they showed in the study was that if you um, treat folks that are slower metabolizers of nicotine with a nicotine patch and you treat fast metabolizers with phrenoclin, you actually get better treatment outcomes. And so this makes sense because um, smokers that metabolize um, since smokers that metabolize nicotine more slowly, they're not going to clear the nicotine out as quickly. And so putting a patch on them, you know, they're, they're not going to clear that out as quickly. And so they might not reach for the cigarette as quickly. And so we wanted to determine how dopamine patterns might be different in these, um, uh, amongst these uh, subgroups that uh, might predict treatment outcome. So the goal for this second study was to examine differences in striatal cigarette-induced dopamine release. Um, so for the first aim, we want to just compare dopamine release patterns between nicotine and patch uh, conditions. And then we wanted to examine factors that predict treatment outcomes, such as high and low pack years, uh, fast and slow nicotine metabolism, and of course, sex differences. However, um, spoiler alert, we did not observe any sex differences in this study. And so we'll come back to this point in the, in the discussion. So we used a double-blind, randomized, counterbalanced, placebo-controlled crossover study. And so we had a nicotine patch condition. Subjects were on that for about a week. Then we scanned them, and they smoked a cigarette during that scan. We had a washout period of at least seven days. And then they got their uh, placebo patch or nicotine patch, whichever condition they hadn't done, for another seven days. And then we did a PET scan in which they smoked uh, mid-session, same as what you saw before. And then we also asked our subjects 
um, to rate their craving and their enjoyment level and how energized they felt by the cigarette before and after. So we use the same smoking paradigm that I showed you previously. We had two Recropide scans um, and a six minute transmission scan and um, the radioactivity dose was matched between the two conditions. And then we used LSRM, which is one of those modeling techniques that I discussed in the beginning. And so our two primary outcome measures here um, were the magnitude of dopamine release, which um, we quantified as gamma over K2A, and then the spatial extent of dopamine release. So the number of voxels that were activated um, by, the, by the cigarette smoke. And so our smokers were about half male and half female. They were aged around 36 years old. They smoked around 14 cigarettes a day for about 18 years, which equates to about 14 pack years. And smokers were moderately dependent on nicotine. And so this is a within subjects design. So we had the same subjects um, that were on a nicotine patch condition as well as the uh, placebo patch condition, which are abbreviated here as NIC and PBO. And what you can see here is that the subjects actually complied with the patch protocol because there are higher levels of both nicotine and cotinine in plasma uh, on the nicotine patch condition compared to the placebo patch condition. So that means the subjects wore their patches every day as we asked them to. Um, and everything else they were matched on between conditions like carbon monoxide levels, withdrawal, and craving. So based on subjective responses, we found that craving was reduced by the cigarette as expected, and that ratings of enjoyment and energized were heightened by the cigarette. And that was the case for both the nicotine and the placebo patch condition. So just to orient you, we're now showing you the magnitude of dopamine release difference between the nicotine and the patch conditions. And so what we found is that the magnitude of dopamine release was both enhanced by nicotine, the nicotine patch in ventral striatum, as well as diminished by the nicotine patch in dorsal striatum. And so this potentially suggests that um, at least in the ventral striatum, we might be seeing sort of an additive effect of the nicotine patch and the cigarette um, on dopamine release, but not in the dorsal striatum. And then just to orient you to the next set of results, here we're showing the um, number of subjects or the percentage of subjects that had a significant um, activation of dopamine by the cigarette smoke. And um, what I'm showing you here is the um, placebo condition for the, both the low and the high pack years group. And what we saw was that the high pack years group activated more voxels than the low pack years group um, under the placebo condition. And this is showing the same exact thing, but under the nicotine condition. And that suggests that potentially more dependent smokers are gonna be more reinforced by the cigarette than less dependent smokers. So the high pack years, so they're smoking more cigarettes for a greater amount of years are showing more dopamine release after the cigarette compared to the lower um, depend or less dependent cigarette smokers. And then in relation to NMR or the metabolism ratio, what we're seeing is that under the placebo condition only, um, fast metabolizers activated more voxels in the ventral striatum and fewer voxels in the dorsal striatum compared to slow metabolizers. So um, this suggests that potentially because the fast metabolizers are more reinforced by the cigarette than the slow metabolizers. And this is just showing you that under the nicotine patch condition, we saw no differences between the groups no significant differences between the groups. And so presumably um, without having nicotine on board, so just under the placebo condition, uh, people who metabolize nicotine faster were more reinforced by the cigarette. So um, what I am showing you here today is that um, the nicotine patch increased the magnitude of cigarette smoking induced dopamine release in ventral striatum. And so this finding is actually really interesting because it can explain why the nicotine patch and other nicotine replacement therapies are not very effective. So as we can see um, here in this graph, um, we can see that this is work um, conducted by Rolema and colleagues. And so they were sort of theorizing why nicotine patches and other nicotine replacement therapies um, might be maintaining and enhancing the reinforcing effects of the cigarette actually. 
Um, and so what we're showing here is that cigarette smoking produces these uh, peaks, so these increases and decreases in the dopamine response. And so this is sort of what drives people to pick up the next cigarette is that, you know, you smoke a cigarette, you get a peak in dopamine. And then when that comes down, you sort of reach for the next cigarette. And so um, these increases and decreases in nicotine levels are sort of the reason why we maintain this cycle of reward and craving. So when we add a nicotine patch to the system, this provides um, sort of a stable level of nicotine that's shown by this gray line here, and that essentially reduces craving when not smoking. However, <laughs> cigarette smoking is still going to cause these steep increases and decreases in dopamine, and so you're still going to reach for that next cigarette because you're still getting that, those rises and falls. And so this group went on to hypothesize that potentially if you used um, varenicline, which is the other uh, FDA approved medication that I mentioned, which is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist, what we could do is sort of prevent this peak. So if we can sort of cut off the full activation of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor um, by nicotine using Chantix, then maybe the cigarette will become less reinforcing. And so this, uh, you know, this, is one mechanism that might explain nicotine replace, why nicotine replacement therapies such as the nicotine patch are not effective, especially in women. And as you know, as I've discussed, they're less reinforced by nicotine in cigarettes. So um, with regards to the results on smoker subgroup categorizations, what we found was that more dependent smokers activated more voxels in dorsal as opposed to ventral regions of the striatum than less dependent um, than less dependent smokers. And this suggests again sort of what has been shown in the preclinical literature, which is this um, migration of dopamine activation from the reward to the habit formation uh, part of the striatum over time. And with regards to nicotine metabolism ratio, what we found was that fast metabolizers activated more voxels than slow metabolizers in the entire stratum under placebo, but there were no differences under nicotine. And this suggests that perhaps there's an enhanced dopamine response to cigarette smoking in individuals that clear nicotine faster. So prior work um, actually showed that um, fast metabolizers of nicotine experience more rapid rate of absorption of nicotine. They have a faster entry of nicotine into the brain, a greater rush from the nicotine, and thus a greater reinforcement, which we're um, confirming here today with the dopamine response. So more dopamine in smokers that cleared the nicotine faster. Um, so for this study, um, just to summarize what I've shown you so far, we, I've shown that nicotine patch alters these highly localized patterns of cigarette smoking induced dopamine release. And these patterns may target different parts of the striatum that are responsible for reward or habit formation. And then we also showed that predictors of treatment outcomes such as level of nicotine dependence and nicotine clearance rate can contribute to these alterations. And so coming back to the point of not observing sex differences um, in this study, our next step is to then examine the dopamine system following the short-term Renaclin or nicotine patch, um, uh, sorry, Renaclin or Chantix treatment. Um, and that's that other FDA approved medication that I mentioned. And there's evidence that Renaclin actually shows uh, better efficacy in women as compared to the nicotine patch. Um, it also shows better efficacy for fast metabolizers of nicotine, um, as I showed you with the Lerman et al. study. And women tend to be fast metabolizers of nicotine, which is partially due to estrogen. And so we expect to see sex differences in dopamine release between the nicotine patch and the varenicline patch condition in women. So we can add to our summary slide here uh, what I've just showed you. Um, which is that dopamine release patterns vary um, by nicotine patch, as well as by uh, purported treatment outcome markers, such as um, dependence levels, as well as metabolism of nicotine. Um, and so next we wanted to explore the other dopamine pathways, so the mesocortical pathway that I mentioned, um, 
And um, that's just mostly because of its involvement in um, stress. So as I mentioned, that's one of the um, factors that could be explaining some of the sex differences. And so the prefrontal cortex is largely unexplored because previously we didn't have a radio tracer that was sensitive enough to pick up on some of these lower dopamine receptor levels that are in the cortex. But now we actually have a few tracers that can do so. And so what we did was replicate study number one, except that instead of having folks smoke a cigarette in the scanner, we gave them amphetamine. And that's because it produces a more robust signal and that allows us to measure dopamine transmission in the cortex, which is also an area in which we see lower dopamine um, levels in general compared to the striatum. So as I mentioned, um, dopamine receptor density in the cortex is much lower than in the striatum. And so in order to measure dopamine receptor availability, we have to use a different tracer with a higher affinity for dopamine um, than in the previous two studies, which we used Braclopride. Um, and now we're gonna be using FLB, which looks at um, cortical uh, dopamine. And so the mesocortical dopamine system is critical for stress-related cognitive functioning and inhibitory control. Um, literature has shown that stress impairs dorsolateral prefrontal cortex functioning and that nicotine alters prefrontal, cord prefrontal cortical and ventral tegmental coupling. And women are more likely to relapse to smoking in response to stress. And so we thought that maybe stress-induced impairment of the prefrontal cortex could explain sex differences in behaviors. And so the goal of this study was to examine differences in cortical dopamine receptor availability and amphetamine-induced dopamine release. And um, we had three aims. So one was we wanted to compare smokers and non-smokers. We also wanted to compare men and women. And we wanted to examine how this might be related to cognitive functioning. So for our study design, we measured extrastriatal or cortical dopamine receptor availability using FLB 457. And you can see the figure on the right just shows a concentration map from one representative subject. And that just shows you that, you know, our radio tracer is sensitive enough to detect extrastriatal dopamine in cortical areas. And so we used an amphetamine challenge to probe the dopamine system. So our participants underwent two PET scans, one prior to and one post-amphetamine on the same day. And the post-amphetamine scan took place three hours after the amphetamine was administered because that corresponds to maximal plasma concentrations of amphetamine and it's consistent with prior work. And then our subjects also performed a verbal learning working memory task called the International Shopping List, um, in which they were asked to recall items on a shopping list immediately, as well as after a short delay of around 30 minutes. So male and female smokers in the study were matched on age and on cigarette characteristics. And so they smoked around 13 to 14 cigarettes a day for about um, 14 to 16 years, and they were moderately dependent based on the Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence. And then smokers were again overnight abstinent for the PET scans. So if we think back to um, our smoker sex differences from study one, we can sort of hypothesize what we might be seeing in the cortex. And um, we can sort of attribute differences in the dopamine system to um, potential sex differences. And so in men, we hypothesize that dopamine release would occur within the ventral striatum, which is what I've showed you, because that's the reinforcement center. And in women, we hypothesize that the prefrontal cortex might play a more important role uh, because that's the area that we use to regulate stress. So the first set of results that I'll describe are just at baseline. Um, so just looking at receptor availability um, without any pharmacological challenge. And what we found was that um, dopamine receptor availability was lower in smokers as compared to non-smokers. And this sort of matches what we've been seeing in the striatum. It matches what we see sort of across um, addiction types that over time dopamine receptor density just begins to decline uh, with continued drug use. 
And so when we split this finding by sex, we find that male smokers actually showed lower dopamine receptor availability, whereas female smokers were comparable. And so this is actually identical to what we show, uh, to what other folks showed in the striatum, which is that the lower receptor availability um, may be related to, uh, may be uh, specific to male smokers and not female smokers. Um, and so when we relate this to cognitive measures, we find that at baseline, smokers have lower dopamine receptor availability. And the lower that receptor availability, the worse they perform on this verbal learning task in which they're asked to recite um, shopping list items back to us. And so you can see that the folks that had lower receptor availability were able to recall less items um, on the shopping list. And that was true at the, for the immediate recall, as well as for the delayed recall that was 30 minutes later. Um, and so we're seeing this relationship in smokers, but not in non-smokers. And so one reason is that maybe smokers are, because they're in acute withdrawal, maybe because they're required to be overnight abstinent, that that could be affecting their cognitive performance. And so just to review, we use amphetamine as a probe uh, to the dopamine system because it has a very robust, long-lasting effect on the brain. And so again, we're, we're measuring receptor availability, then introducing a challenge. We get more dopamine release that binds to the receptor. And so there are less available receptors for the radio tracer to bind. And so we get um, higher receptor availability at baseline, and then it, it becomes lower after the challenge. And we can calculate the percent change in binding potential where lower binding potential means more dopamine release. It's sort of the opposite of what you'll see um, on the graphs here. And so we can use this as sort of an indirect measure of dopamine release. So what we find is that there's a main effect of sex on dopamine release where female smokers show less dopamine release than male, uh, sorry, females show less dopamine release than males in general in the dorsal striatum. And so when we split this finding by sex, uh, sorry, by smoker groups, um, and just to orient you, we're using open circles for before amphetamine, closed circles for after amphetamine, and then we have the four subgroups. So female non-smokers, female smokers, male non-smokers, male smokers. Um, and what I have here is just the percent difference in, in dopamine release that we're seeing um, between the two conditions for each of the four subgroups. And what you can see is that um, for most of the subgroups, there's about a 10% change in, uh, in dopamine release compared to baseline, except for the female smokers. And so they're showing a percent change of about 2%. And you know, test retest for this radio tracer is about 5%. And so it's almost negligible, this difference between the groups, uh, between the conditions. And so this is really surprising because we're, we're giving female smokers amphetamine and they're not releasing dopamine. And so this just tells us that there's, you know, potentially something going on with their ability to release dopamine and their neurotransmitter functioning for the dopamine system. So female smokers um, showed lower dopamine release than their male smokers. Um, and you can see here just in the, um, in the, dopamine release brain maps. There are stark differences here in that, in that region where uh, white and yellow represents higher dopamine release. And overall, you can see female smokers have less dopamine release in the whole brain as shown by darker colors um, like the black and red. Um, female smokers also showed less dopamine release compared to the female non-smokers, which tells us that this is not something that we're seeing in, um, you know, that's specific to females, but it's actually specific to um, females uh, to female smokers, not just females. Um, so in summary for this study, what we're showing is that, um, you know, this is the first study actually to show that cortical dopamine receptor availability is lower in smokers compared to non-smokers. And this is consistent with literature in tobacco smokers and other substance use populations in the striatum. Uh, we also show that this is specific to uh, male smokers and not female smokers. And then the, in terms of changes to cortical dopamine release, what we're showing is that female smokers have lower dopamine release than male smokers, as well as their female non-smoker counterparts. And then in terms of the um, cognitive functioning, we can see that lower dopamine receptor availability was associated with poor verbal learning.
So from the study, we can um, again, fill in what we've learned about the cortical dopamine system in tobacco smokers. And so again, the study was the first to explore the cortical dopamine system in smokers by sex. And the dopamine receptor findings were consistent with previous literature in the striatum. And, uh, but however, the study actually, you know, while it answered a lot of questions, it also revealed a number of new questions regarding the dopamine mechanisms in women, which seem to be just lower across the board. And so I'll just add in one more study to this uh, already really busy summary slide here, uh, which is work from ED London's group at UCLA. And they showed that uh, in midbrain, which is, uh, includes the VTA in this region where dopamine cells originate, what we see is that um, this area is thought to be involved in autoregulation. And what they found was that female smokers have greater autoregulation than female non-smokers, but that the uh, male groups were comparable. And so this tells us that potentially female smokers have more autoregulation of dopamine release. And so that could explain why their dopamine receptor numbers are not as downregulated and why their dopamine release is <laughs> highly um, downregulated. And so this sort of highlights the need to better understand these mechanisms and how they might be contributing to um, smoking characteristics, specifically in female smokers. So these findings have critical implications in the field uh, and this lack of an amphetamine induced dopamine response is pretty alarming for women who smoke. So a deficit in dopamine response suggests an inability to transition easily from drug taking rewards to natural rewards and this is critical. Uh, also a blunted dopamine response has been shown by the Martinez group uh, to be involved in, um, to, to be related to poor treatment outcomes. So this was a cocaine use sample that they described in the study, but the lower dopamine response that they had, the poor they performed in treatment. And this can underlie findings that show that women have uh, poor smoking treatment outcomes than men. So one of the ways in which we'd like to sort of further explore sex differences is by eliciting stress in male and female smokers. As you recall, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that stress may play a role in smoking initiation and that relapse uh, and relapse for women. And so we currently have an ongoing study uh, in which we're looking at the, um, we're using a physiological stressor called LPS or endotoxin, and we're sort of stimulating the dopamine system and then uh, looking for differences between sexes. Um, and so we've already published like a small um, subset of, of this, which doesn't include sex differences, um, just on based on sort of how we can elicit stress using this um, paradigm in smokers. And this is part of a really like large complex project conducted by um, Dr. Evan Morris and colleagues in collaboration with several folks um, and includes behavioral outcomes as well as fMRI and some smoking labs paradigm. Um, cortisol levels, subjective stress levels, et cetera. And so, you know, maybe next time I'm invited to uh, speak with you all, I can share some of those uh, exciting results. So first, just a couple of caveats to sum up. Um, although I've been portraying this as sort of black and white and or pink or blue, uh, it's obviously not that simple. And addiction is a multifaceted problem, as you saw in some of the data where you see dopamine release is both increased and decreased within the same brain region. Um, and so although I'm showing you sort of how the dopamine system is perturbed, it's important to keep in mind that the dopamine system is actually interacting with a whole host of other neurotransmitter and neurobiological processes um, to respond to these pharmacological stimuli that I'm presenting here. And so addiction is a result of the changes in multiple neurotransmitter systems and receptor systems coupled with environmental and behavioral secondary reinforcers that support continued smoking. So nonetheless, what this work accomplished is that it identified neurochemical mechanisms that might explain behavioral sex differences. So what I've showed you is that the dopamine signature varies based on sex and gender, and that there's, and it also varies based on predictors of treatment response, such as nicotine dependence level, as well as nicotine metabolism. And then perhaps one of the most important take home messages of this talk is um, that women matter. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we should all sort of design our studies and analyze our data to better understand both men and women and whether you see sex differences or not, it's important to report them. And so with that, I'd just like to thank the uh, Morris Lab and the Cosgrove Lab, our collaborators, our funding sources, the Yale Pet Center, the Magnetic Resonance Imaging Center, our research subjects, 
And I do want to thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take questions.